Is this going to rub, though? Or is that good? It's OK? Do you want it like that? Is that too loud? OK. What? Do you want me to talk? Uh, what? Up higher? How's that? OK. Does that sound good? I don't know. OK. I'm going to turn it off for now.
Testing. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Blackhurst, the proud president of Minnesota State University Moorhead, and it is my privilege to welcome you this afternoon to the Dill Distinguished Faculty Lecture. The Dill Lectureship is one of the highest honors the university bestows on a faculty member, and it is named in honor of Roland Dill, the eighth president of MSUM, who served for as president for 26 years, and his wife, Beth. We're honored this afternoon to, to have two members of the Dill family with us, and I'm going to embarrass them by introducing them. We're so glad they're here. Uh, Roland and Beth's daughter, Sarah, and, <laughs> and their daughter, Martha. We're so glad you're both here. Thank you so much for coming, and we're so glad all of you are here. It's so good to see you and to see you in person and to see your entire faces. Uh, I will turn it over now to our provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Eric Jackson, who will talk a little bit more about the Dill Fund and the Distinguished Faculty Lecture. Thank you, President Ann. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> We're back together face to face with a chance to celebrate uh, faculty work. We do a lot of things recognizing our students um, throughout the year and at the end of the semester we really celebrate the students through graduation. Um, however, you know when the semester ends or the class ends, um, sometimes the students just leave or they didn't show up for the exam or something of that nature. Um, but sometimes they'll wait at the end of the class and they'll give the professor a recognition and they'll applaud. And then, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen. But moments like this is when we get to applaud the work of professors and the things they do in the classroom. And if you know anything about MSUM, um, they really work to mentor the students, guide them, advise them, and really be there for them. And that's one of the things that we're well known for. When people come back to the university, they say those things. So uh, today we're here to do that. But before I get started, I do want to take a moment to recognize all of our past deal recipients. Um, so if you are a past deal recipient, please take a moment and stand up to be recognized. Thank you again for all the work done. Um, as President Ann said, the Dill Fund for Excellence is a permanent endowment established in 1994 by the MSUM Alumni Fum Foundation. Through the generosity of the MSUM alumni and friends to honor the university's former president, Roland Dill, and his wife, Beth Dill, the endowment raised nearly 3.2 million gifts and pledges in 1994 and supports annual grants in the Dill Distinguished Faculty Lecture Award, which we're here to celebrate today. Each year, the Dill Fund for Excellence Committee and the President select one MSUM faculty member to receive the Dill Distinguished Faculty Lecture Award. The Dill Distinguished Faculty Lecture Award is one of the highest honors at Minnesota State University Moorhead bestows to its faculty. Honorees receive an honorarium and a commemorative desk clock. So you'll be able to, <laughs> in case you forget what time it is. <laughs> uh, so this ceremony is used to really recognize the faculty member, celebrate the faculty member, celebrate their work, and take a moment out to watch what happens in that classroom and why this faculty member has been chosen for that. So before we get started, I'm going to introduce Dean Lisa Narat. She is the Dean of the College of Science, Health, and Environment, which Lisa is also a faculty member of. And Lisa's going to give a bio introduction of Lisa, so the two Lisas, <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll turn it over to Lisa for the lecture. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you for being here, and um, please enjoy. Thank you, uh, thank you all very much. Um, 
It is my great pleasure uh, to be here. I am Lisa Narod, Dean of the College of Science, Health, and Environment. Uh, and it's my pleasure and privilege to um, introduce this year's DIL Distinguished Faculty Lecturer, Dr. Lisa Stewart. Uh, now, I've known Lisa for more than 20 years. Um, we started here at MSUM in the psychology department at about the same time. Um, and having two Lisas in one department, sometimes a little confusing. Um, we used to joke about calling ourselves Big Lisa, Little Lisa, Tall Lisa, Short Lisa. <laughs> um, I'm glad that didn't stick. <laughs> but to be perfectly honest, um, I've never minded being confused um, for you from time to time. Uh, and the reason is um, Lisa is an extremely accomplished individual. Um, as a scholar, uh, Lisa regularly publishes book chapters and articles in top journals. She presents at conferences and in-service trainings all over the country. She has received the MSUM Excellence Award for Research. Lisa is also a gifted teacher. This past couple of years, I looked at her undergraduate class ratings. On a scale of one to five, they average 4.9, and that was from over 500 students in introductory psychology classes during COVID. So that's amazing. It speaks certainly to her ability as an educator. During that same period, graduate students, of course, 5.0 was the average rating in those classes. So perhaps not surprisingly, she has also received the Minnesota Psychological Association Graduate Educator of the Year Award. As director of the School Psychology Graduate Program, Lisa has been a driving force in major program redesign over the past couple of years. And as a result, we are going to welcome more students than ever into our graduate school psychology program this year. Yes, absolutely. In her nomination materials, it really was the student and alumni letters that captured all that Lisa has done and continues to do for students. The word that came up most was mentor. She was described as a great teacher and mentor with so much knowledge to share a trusted mentor, and a lifelong mentor. One student wrote, her influence has gone beyond the walls of the institution and the date of my graduation. Another said, she saw who I was and had more faith in my abilities than I did. And finally, someone wrote, even now, after 20 years after my MSUM graduation, in just the last month, I received two emails from Dr. Stewart with links to articles about developments in the field she thought I would be interested in. So she is indeed an accomplished scholar, teacher, mentor, and I'm proud to call her my colleague and friend, Dr. Lisa Stewart. Okay. Where's Hunter? Is it working? We're good? Okay, now I talk really loud, so if it's too loud, you've got to go like this, like calm me down. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I did contemplate just um, handing out a whole bunch of picture books and just sitting around and doing some repeated read-alouds where you guys could just read some books to each other, talk about the concepts in them, and learn from each other because honestly, that's a really good thing to do, right? So um, we we'll talk about books in a little bit. Um, again, thank you uh, for this honor from MSU. I do want to acknowledge I'll be talking about some work and partnerships that have had really important partnerships with um, the AmeriCorps Program Reading Corps. So this is my plug. If you want to do service for your country and for your community, um, please look into the AmeriCorps programs. In particular, I'm very passionate about Reading Corps. So um, they also have math core and DISCA and a bunch of other things. <laughs> um, I also, um, I am on the board of directors for an organization called Seeds or Fluent Seeds and I have worked closely with Kate Horst and the Seeds um, uh, organization for a long time and you'll see their influence. Um, Kate Horst was, has been and continues to be a mentor for me. Um, also, of course, thank you to the Dills for um, Roland and Beth and this legacy that they've given us. Um, and um, Roland Dill, you might, might know, is a professor in, in the English department, and he had a love for words, so I hope he would like this topic. 
um, and he loved poetry. Um, but his wife, Beth, also was very involved in the campus community, promoting theater productions, and she was a great supporter of women's college athletics during a time when they were really just taking off and building in strength and in prowess. And I'm happy to say that during that time, I was a college athlete, not at MSUM, but um, I played basketball and volleyball at Gustavus Adolphus. Um, unfortunately, also during that time, perms <laughs> were all the thing. <laughs> So just saying, yeah. Um, as as uh, Lisa Narat uh, said, I am a professor in the school psychology graduate program in the psychology department. And so I do want to just say that school psychologists work in every school. We work alongside teachers and administrators and school counselors. And we probably have some of our school counseling folks here, speech language pathologists. I know we have uh, them in the house. I'm a little nervous because I'm talking about language to speech language pathologists or speech language hearing science people. Um, and other people in the school, and school psychologists work to help kids to be successful in school and promote overall wellness, right? And so it's an exciting profession. There's my plug for school psychology. My students there, yeah, you know who you are. Okay. All right. Um, now, some people are surprised when they hear I'm a school psychologist and I do early literacy work. And because they expect me to be a psychologist works with mental health. And we do. School psychologists do promote and support um, students in their mental health, in their social emotional skills, their behavioral skills. But we also support them in becoming academically successful and feeling like they belong in school and that they have potential. And reading is a huge part of that. W if you learn how to read successfully on time, it can build your self-esteem, your sense of belonging, your overall just sense that you are a learner, right? And so my argument is that, oh shoot, this doesn't work on these screens. Darn it, I'm gonna, I can walk over to them though, right? <laughs> so teaching a child to read is a mental health intervention. So I want you to say that out loud with me. Teaching a child to read is a mental health intervention. And I have some research to back that up. One of the things it is, is it's a coping mechanism, right? Have, who hasn't? Um, escaped or reduced their stress by digging into a good book or writing in a journal or things like that, right? So reading and writing is part of coping, but it also is a preventive measure because it is so linked to success in life, success in school, that sense of self-esteem, that sense of belonging. And uh, unfortunately, that's even more important for uh, kids that are minority, at risk, uh, poverty, and those are the very kids that often do struggle um, in learning how to read, and so I see it also as an equity issue. Um, I won't read that, all the whole quote there, but um, just to, you know, I, I have to put in some references to show that I'm not just making this up. So the children with reading difficulties are at elevated risk for externalizing and internalizing mental health problems. Reading ability is also negatively associated with self-esteem, a consistent predictor of child and adolescent mental health more broadly, okay? I think I just said I wasn't gonna read it, and then I did, did I? Okay, all right. Um, now, if you are my student, you might be screaming, correlational data, correlation doesn't equal causation, thank you. Um, and correlation is important, we look for patterns, but they're actually longitudinal um, data, and we can't exactly say, you're gonna be a bad reader, you're gonna be a good reader, right? We can't experimentally manipulate that, but we do have convincing quasi-experimental um, evidence that this is a directional finding that if you become, uh, if you are on track and become a good reader, it is a resiliency factor for mental health, okay? Um, and uh, unfortunately, we're not doing that great of a job at teaching kids how to read. Um, and as I said, even more so for some of our most at-risk kids. This particular slide has the MCA, the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessment Data Scores. I just took the ones that were pre-COVID, you know, um, and on the left here shows the number of kids who scored below basic. And basic is pretty basic. Proficient is actually where we want kids to be. Basic means eh, they're getting there, but there are kids who are below basic. And if you can see this, I don't know, with the monitors, that's nice, you might actually be able to read it. It ranges from about 27 to 31% for years and years and years. A third of our kids in fourth grade, that's the, the grade that this data is from, are not reading successfully. That makes me really upset. 
And as a school psychologist, we have a saying, we are not problem admirers, we are problem solvers. solvers. Thank you, school psychologists. We don't just admire problems, we solve problems. And so I got involved in early reading intervention research. And from there, I found uh, a lot of interesting things, but one of the things I found is that, you know, kindergarten kids are already really discrepant. So then I went into pre-K, and when I went into pre-K and looked at the, at the precursors of reading skills, what I found was that a lot of those had that basic foundation of overall language development, and I needed to really get to know my language development better. And really some of our interventions are language interventions, not just literacy interventions. And I'll talk about the difference between the two. So, why is this the picture for the Dill Lecture? All right, let's see if I can do this. I had to take this twice, by the way. I was going to have them Photoshop it, but they said they wanted real props. Okay, turn to an elbow partner. Do not leave anybody out. It's okay if they're groups of three. Don't always make sure everybody's included. Why is this my picture for this talk? Go. You didn't notice? You thought it was an apple? <laughs> yeah. Some people thought it was a baby chick. So don't feel bad. Yeah. Okay, three. You're finishing up your conversations. Two. You're turning back toward the front. One, we're going to share up. By the way, for those of you who thought it was an apple, it's actually a pear. Um, it's not a baby chick. Some people also, Courtney, thought it was a baby chick, right? <laughs> so, but why do, why, do I have, why do I have those props? Because pear and pear. Pear and pear, right? Okay, so tell, tell me more. Add on to that. Da oh, that? I didn't think of that. that see, this is why we do <laughs> implicit instruction. I could go there in a different talk, but not today. Okay, what, what else? Complexity of language. We have these two words that sound exactly the same but mean very different things, right? And they're spelled differently. It's called a homonym. You don't have to know that or remember that, but you know. Okay, why, why else do you think? It's related, well, re it makes our language challenging that we have these words that sound the same but we have different phonics rules or ways that the sounds map onto those little squiggles on paper that we call letters, right? And so that's what, uh, it turns out that English is, is um, one of the languages that's actually orthographically opaque. Doesn't that sound like, you know, you could like earn your college tuition by saying that to your parents, right? <laughs> so orthographically opaque means that, that the, the way the letters map onto the sounds isn't always regular. Like you can do fast, F-A-S-T, but then if you want to do a phoneme, talk about a phoneme, that's P-H-O-N-E, and they both say at the beginning, like, ah, crap, right? So that does make it harder. And also gets to one of the things that I think is overlooked the most in early literacy and especially in kindergarten, but, um, and that's phonological awareness, which means that, that awareness of the sounds and words. So really it's just a prop for me to start talking about language and how language underlies literacy and learning how to read and write. Okay, so what is language? This is the part where I get nervous that you guys are here. Okay, language can be spoken, written, or used like ASL, a communicative sign language, and they're generally accepted about five different parts of language. One of those is phonology, an awareness of the sounds in the words. And so phonology is, starts out like, has it, raise your hand if you've ever listened to somebody speak a foreign language and it sounded like they were talking really fast, right? Yeah. It turns out that when they study rate of speech, that's not actually generally true. Like some people do talk fast like me, but that's true across different languages. Um, but what, why it feels like that is that you have not developed that awareness of how to separate that string of sounds into words. So that's hard to process. It's hard to understand it. And as soon as you can, then all of a sudden, it becomes much easier to listen to that and, and not feel overwhelmed by that string of sounds, right? And then kids also learn about the rhythm of language. So this is where kids' books are so much fun. By the way, poetry is also another place where this is really fun. So 
This is uh, a book, one of my son's favorite books, Trucks Roll, when he was little. And it's about different pages on, on different things that trucks and truckers do and things that trucks haul. But there's this one page that I would love to read to him. It's about in the morning, they stop at a truck stop and then, and then it goes like this. It goes then, key in the slot, coffee in the cup, truckers at the wheel when the sun comes up. Right, can't you just like, feel that? And it's so that rhythm of language. So there's that just fun aspect. And some of that is a thing called syllables, right? So pear has one syllable, clap it with me, pear. How about apple, apple. How about banana, banana, right? So you can feel that rhythm, and if kids can learn to listen and feel that, that gives them that sense that there's different rhythms and sounds in words, and then you can really go crazy with that. You can say like, um, what rhymes with cat? Bat, what else? Hat, why do they rhyme? They sound the same at the end. Now Mary's my plant because that is one of the things. <laughs> in reading core, we developed what are called transition songs that make this explicit. So I'll talk about explicit instruction and implicit instruction. And explicit instruction is when you do something that's fun and developmentally appropriate, but you make, you take the mystery out of it for the kid, right? So we have this thing that goes cat, hat, these two rhyme, cat, hat, these two rhyme, cat, hat, these two rhyme, they sound the same at the end, at, right? <laughs> and then, and, the, and, and four year olds, I mean, oh my gosh, they're just like, Yes, you know? And then somebody, uh, then you say like, what, what else? What else rhymes with cat? And somebody will say mouse. And you're like, cat, mouse, they don't rhyme. Cat, mouse, they don't rhyme. And you do it in a gentle, you know, no, no like making kids cry or anything. But, but and, and if you think this doesn't work to help them learn, you have never seen a four-year-old talk to another four-year-old doing, doing playtime going, that rhymes. They sound the same at the end, you know? So they get that. So how about this? An alliteration, Lisa loves lollipops. The opposite, right? The first sound stays the same, the rest of them change, right? And how about blending? Blending and segmenting, that's really where you're hitting the, the road for literacy. So the word, um, I'm gonna blend the word bake. B, A, K, bake, okay? So I gave the individual sounds and then I put it together. I'm gonna give you a different word and you're gonna blend it. Ah, stop. Good. You guys are good at this. Okay, so that's blending. Segmenting is when you do the opposite. You give the kid a word and they pull it apart. So what are the sounds in stop? Turn to a person next to you and, and do hold up your fingers and tell what are the segments or the sounds in stop. Go. Okay. <laughs> All right. How many sounds? Four sounds. How about bake? I, I used that one earlier. So how many sounds are there in bake? There's three. How many letters are there in bake? Four. Four. Oh. <laughs> so this is where it gets complicated, right? So kids need to learn those sounds, um, and they need to find that out early, because if they don't find that out early, they can't, they can't manipulate those words, and they can't map it onto those little squiggles that we call letters, and I'll get more into that later. There are other parts of language, though, that I've learned are important that I used to overlook. One is called morphology. Morphology is the smallest meaning parts, and um, smallest, uh, what do I say here? I'll read it. Smallest meaning in word or word parts. So take a word, word like bicycle, right? It actually has two morphemes, bi and cycle. Bi means, cycle means circle or round, right? So does that tell you, even if you didn't, even if you came from another planet where you'd never seen a bicycle, could you maybe guess what a bicycle is if you knew that bi meant two and cycle meant circle? At least, I mean, you might not know it was something you rode, but you would, you would probably have a good guess. It would be a part of your comprehension of that word that would enable you to figure it out. Anybody here but was a spelling bee champ? Yeah, you guys are good at this. Etymology, etymo I can't ever say that word. Etymology of words. Um, and the morphology. Now, this is one I talked about how this is going to connect to my classes. I do this in class as well. So the very first day, intro psych, I'm like, psychology. Did I not do this, guys? <laughs> psychology, what does it mean? Psyche means mind. It actually also means soul, if you go back deep enough. And ology means study of. 
So psychology is the study of the mind and the soul, which you can get really deep with, especially if you go Jungian on everybody. Okay, so, so that morphology can be used even in college with our graduate students, right? It's something that's super powerful. And I think underutilized, so there's my plug for you to use more morphology in your classes. By the way, I usually ask classes, you know, big intro psych, 100 students, probably one to 10 say they've actually been taught the different suffixes, prefixes, and parts of morphology. Guess where they've typically been taught? Either they've taken Latin class, they went to a school that had Latin, or where's Brian? You might guess this, your wife probably does. Medical terminology or anatomy and physiology. Those are the two where they typically, typically went, right? Okay, syntax is the order, noun, verb. If you've ever learned a language that had a different order, you know how important that is and how easy it is to get confused. Semantics is the meaning of the word. So go back to pair and pair. If you knew that there were two words, if you didn't know that there were two words that had that same um, sound, and somebody said, well, I just ate a pear, and you only thought this was a pear, you might think, whoa, that's weird, right? So the more words that you know and know the meaning of, the better, in, in Kate Horse language, she calls it the magic store. You have all those things in your brain, and you can connect them to what people are saying and what's in the books or what you're reading. Okay, I'm going fast because I want to get to my research. Okay, and then pragmatics, which is just that the practical use of language, that we use it to co uh, communicate something. So all these are pieces of language, right? So I, when I first started out, I said I did more K through two, but I was really fascinated with this phonological awareness piece and phoneme, um, phonemes and the sounds and words because we know that students, at-risk students, often don't get this piece. It's most, it's the thing that if you have a child who is struggling to read, it's one of the predictors that they're going to continue to struggle unless you get a really skilled person in there teaching, right? So it's one of the symptoms of dyslexia, but it can also be present in kids who just haven't had a lot of language play and don't know about those sounds. So this, I had to go back, I wish Jamie were here. Um, this is one of my graduate students, her thesis. She actually looked at the number, uh, the phoneme segmentation fluency, so can kids pull those sounds apart, was a multiple baseline study where kids were in their regular classroom not doing very well, and then she did the early reading intervention, uh, phonological awareness intervention, and look at some of these kids. Two or three sessions later, boom, I get it, right? And that's the kind of, that's, that's that problem solving versus problem admiring, that we have interventions that can work. Uh, and I get really excited about that. But I wanted to go younger, so I paired up and was able to, to work with Kate Horst and Seeds and with Reading Corps. And this is actually a fluent Seeds symbol. They use a lot of hands, hands for everything. Um, and so she took the early literacy things that predicted, or uh, before kids even get to kindergarten, what predicts how well they'll do in kindergarten, first, second grade. Now don't worry, I'm not going to go through all five of these because we've already talked about most of them. The, the thumb is language, oral language, conversation, pragmatics, we've talked about, right? Phonological, we talked about that. The pinky, vocabulary, that semantic meaning we need to know what words mean. But these two we haven't talked a lot about yet. Kids need to understand what print is, how a book works, how that print goes from left to right, and then they need to get the alphabetic principle, the idea that those squiggles on the page map onto the sounds and they start learning to read what, what's written and start being able to write. Sometimes they write really crazy spellings, but phonetically it's, it, it makes total sense, right? And so these are the things that, that um, are, we want preschoolers to be able to really be immersed in and if they're, if they're behind, I don't like to use that word, uh, if they're at risk or if they haven't had a really enriched environment, we want to give that to them and make sure that they're getting what they need. So in my pairing with, um, with SEEDS and with Reading Corps, um, what they do is they use AmeriCorps volunteers to go out and put into place a model that has those embedded, embedded explicit and implicit opportunities, like actually teaches the kids what to do, but does it in a way that also encourages them to explore and think. And 
they focus on a relationship-based model. I haven't talked about this part yet. Um, Patricia Cool, if you haven't read her work, she's at the University of Washington, she is amazing. And she talks about how kids are actually hardwired for oral language, that they take statistics on the sounds around them, but they only do that really well in social interactions. It's in relationship. They don't get it from a screen, people. The best app is your lap. Say that out loud. The best app is your lap. Seriously, not kidding. Okay. Um, the, this particular model, the Reading Core model, does a multi-tiered systems of support, which means that we, we make sure that the sea the kids are swimming in in that classroom is really rich, but if they really are at risk or need more, we give them a little more. That's basically what that means. We use data to help decide that, and we support the teachers and the AmeriCorps volunteers so that they don't, I mean, it's hard. This is hard work. There's a saying that reading is rocket science. It really is. It's hard work. There are some favorite tools that I have from Reading Core. I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, some of those relate to my research, so I'll point out those repeated read aloud or a dialogic read aloud, the top left. Oh my gosh. Like I said, what an amazing thing. What happens when, and dialogic, by the way, that means that you're not just, like, you sit quiet now. You don't sit, Karen. No, sit, sit. Karen, sit. No. Mouth shut. Mm, zip it. Okay. No, that's not how you do it. You're like, oh, what do you think is going to be in this book? What do you think this book is about? Right? It's interactive. It's dialogic. Whether it's one, your own kid or your grandkids sitting on your lap or you're in a classroom. Right? And so, um, so what you do is you take that read aloud and you train the teacher how to really embed explicit, like, teach vocabulary. We're going to teach the word you know, uh, a word that's really important for the meaning in this book, and we're going to explicitly teach it. We're going to say, this word is cucumber. Say cucumber. cucumber. A cucumber is a fruit or a vegetable. I don't know. Anyway, that was a bad example. I should have worked <laughs> that out. Okay. So, but, you know, they actually practice, and then when they're reading the book, they'll be like, oh, cucumber. There's a cute, right? And they'll, they'll get really excited, and, and they really are, are understanding in context as well as teaching them explicitly. So the repeated read aloud is gold, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or it's like my favorite thing. Um, this on the bottom left is what we call the math and literacy rich schedule. That is basically a way where a teacher in a preschool or if you're in a, a daycare, you take your day and you figure out how am I going to fit in those five, right? Where am I going to make sure the kid is swimming in a rich sea of this language environment? And so you plan for it because if you don't plan for it, it doesn't happen, right? Down, down here is the what is it bag. I actually, so this is proof that you can get this. In. This is like the ugliest bag, it even has a hole in the bottom. But this is just a language prop, right? You do a go, what is it? What is it? What is it do you know? It's a mask. It's a mask. Tell me what you know. And what do you know about a mask? Eric makes it hard to breathe. <laughs> hard to breathe. Eric, is that, does it make it hard? What else do you know about a mask? Uh, that it's a horrible thing to use. <laughs> okay. Does anything have, anybody have anything positive to say about the mask? Okay. So what it is is it just, and you, teachers can put anything in there. They can put things that start with the same sound. They can put things, lessons they want to teach. I've had teachers put, like, a sad face. This is a sad face. What do we know about sad faces, right? That's important to have those conversations. So it's a very versatile tool. I love it. Um, we use those songs, like the, you know, cat hat, these two rhyme. We have different ones for alliteration. Um, how many people did the A, B, C, D, E, F, G when they were little, right? How many people thought L, M, N, O, P was one letter, right? <laughs> so it's much better to do like Dr. Jeans or do A, A, Apple, B, B, Ball, C, C, Computer, D, D, Doll. Now, it's not a big difference, but it's explicit, and it links the letter to the sound. And, and by the way, they use short vowels, a, a, alligator, because that's the most common in both print and, and language, that it's a short vowel. So, so that's some of those. And then, of course, there's Strive for Five. Strive for Five is conversation, and that's that relationship piece. It's so critical that we do this while we're tuned in to the kids and tuned in to each other. So again, linked to my own teaching, 
I'm not always good at this. You guys know this, because sometimes I get excited and I talk too much. But it is really important to listen and to engage. Strive for five just means I, I might ask a question, or you might, and then let's say I ask a question and Amy tells me what she thinks. Instead of just moving on, like I actually negative example there when I did with you guys, um, I would follow up and, and maybe ask another question or add on to it, and then she would, and we're, soon we're having a conversation. Five turns is what we strive for. That's why it's called strive for five. And that is really a powerful tool for getting teachers to slow down, including myself. I just realized, yeah, that I didn't do that. So. Okay, so these are some of the tools that we use in Reading Core. It's all over the country now, it's in multiple places, but um, I also had the opportunity as a researcher to take some of those tools and figure out how we could make them better. So this is, Kayla just had a baby the other day, uh, Kayla Kuntz. Um, uh, uh, Borowitz, um, uh, did this research and what she was looking at is that repeated read aloud. What about the questions you ask when you're reading aloud? And she compared control to contextual to analytical. Control was like whatever the teacher would ask, whatever they think of, right? Contextual means something from within the story. Analytical means connecting it to their everyday life. And she found that when you connect things to the kid's everyday life, the, the, the um, gray Slashed bars are their scores before, and the red is the, the scores after. The bigger gains were in the analytical, when you can connect it to their everyday life. They learn more. So then that went into reading core in terms of their training and how they taught kids to ask, or taught the teachers how to ask questions. So isn't that cool that, you know, we, I had that like research and then research to practice, kind of like pipeline. I also was fortunate that I got to work with the, the University of Chicago was commissioned by the, commis by the federal organization that oversees AmeriCorps, and they did a multi-million dollar three-year <laughs> research grant to evaluate Reading Corps. And I got to help design and give input on it. I am not one of the major authors. They did a lot of the work. I, did, I didn't have time. So, um, <laughs> but I do want to share with you their findings because I think they're really powerful. Over 1,500 students, third, four, three, four, and five-year-olds, 25 Minnesota Reading Corps sites, 25 comparison sites, and that by me, they worked hard to get good comparison sites, like same size, same student makeup, same amount of instructional time, same amount of support, of, um, they all had to have like a curriculum and kind of have a certain level of understanding of early literacy, right? And, um, and then we looked at uh, the independent variables, just whether they were Reading Corps or not Reading Corps. Um, we did do a whole year of process figuring out how we would tell what they were doing and how it differed or was the same. And then the outcome variables were measures on early literacy. They were called the Individual Growth and Development Indicators. If you've been in education, we have a lot of acronyms, so they're the IGD. So, are you ready for it? Here's our results. So, and this was in 2015. By the way, this has been replicated in Florida, and uh, they just did another study in uh, California, and very similar results. So here's the fall data. I'm going to pick this one. This one's picture naming fluency. This is vocabulary development, all right? Vocabulary development in the fall, or how their measures, were very similar. So that means we did a good job of picking comparison sites, right? So the gray is the comparison, red is the reading course sites. Luckily, the, the kids in the other sites grew too. We wouldn't have wanted them to stay the same, right? That would be bad. But look at how much more the reading core sites um, grew. And it was not only statistically significantly different, it had an effect size of 0.49. That's the picture naming effect size. That means almost half of a standard deviation better, which is a meaningful difference. You could translate it, given what we know about growth of vocabulary, to a difference of about four to six months of, of language development. Think about that, these are four year olds. I mean, that's huge, right? So how about, how do we do on phonological awareness? Rhyming and alliteration, effect size of 0 0.66, 0 0.72. Letter sounds, whether or not they could identify the sounds, letters of alphabetic principle, 0 0.71. Letter names, 0.40. It turns out, turns out that a lot of programs focus, have like a letter of the week or something, right? So um, I hope you're as impressed as I was. I was like over the moon. This is exciting stuff. You don't look excited enough, Sarah. You have to be really excited about this. Okay. Um, the most exciting part, though, was this bottom part, four to five-year-olds. 
subgroup analysis looked at dual language learners, which is how they classified it. We might use ELL or uh, anyway, students whose language was first language was not English, um, compared to students whose first language was Eng English. And we found a statistically significant difference between those two groups. And honestly, when you find that in research, it almost always is in the favor of the English speaking kids. And in this case, it wasn't. Our DLL kids actually grew more. And that means we were cho closing the gap. And that was pretty darn exciting. Okay. So, how much time do I have left? Like two minutes? Okay. I got seven minutes, people. Okay, here we go. <laughs> what about math? Remember I said we had a math and literacy rich schedule? Yeah, we weren't doing much with math. So, um, and it turns out that early math, you might think early uh, math, you have to like teach math. But math is language. Math, if you want to compare and contrast, you have to know what compare and contrast mean, right? If you tell a kid to sort something, they have to know what the word sort means. <laughs> if you say that something is bigger or smaller, those are, those are words, those are terms that they need to get embedded into their vocabulary. And so um, I worked with, oh, and I'm gonna skip this one, just to, but, but we know that actually the same way that reading and early literacy skills are not equally, um, uh, that not everybody starts at the same place when they get to school, the same is very true for math and it also predicts not very good outcomes. So it's, there's an equity piece there too. So Josh Johnson um, and Ashley Dahl, now Ashley Reader, and Kate Labrassor, some of my students, worked on a math study where we were hoping to, again, inform what Reading Corps was doing. And what we did is we just took a bunch of kids and we actually were able to randomly assign them to either a vocabulary enriched group or a typical math activity group. And I won't go through all the details, but basically we met with them a couple times a week for six weeks. So it wasn't a huge, a terribly long time, but a meaningful amount of instruction. And we looked to see in the vocabulary enriched group, did they do better, not just on the vocabulary, but on understanding the concept of math. So you might be asking yourself, well you might be asking yourself when this is done and you can eat those cookies. But you might also be asking yourself, what do you mean by vocabulary, vocabulary enriched math group? So all we did was we would say things like, we're gonna talk about some math things today. One of the words we're gonna use is equal. Say equal. equal. Yeah, equal means a, the same amount. Say the same amount. Same amount. Now I know four-year-olds might not know what amount is either, so sometimes we would use multiple different terms and, and to, but we'd basically give them the word and then we'd do the exact same activity that they would do in the typical math activity. We did the same things with them but while we were doing it, we would make sure and use the words while we were doing it. And what happened? Well, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> um, they did a lot of measuring. It was very active. They were all over the playground. They, anyway, they were hilarious. There, this is Josh, by the way, one of our students who's now a school psych in um, Lake Park Audubon, to, or Lake Agassiz uh, Special Ed Co-op. And what we found is that in the typical group, they did do better on expressive language, but our vocabulary rich kids are like, Poof, this means that they could tell us what those words meant, the words in our study. Not too surprising. I mean, after all, we were spending a lot of time on those words, but still nice to know. Receptively, we had things that show, because sometimes you, it's kind of a precursor to expressive, whether or not the kids can identify the words. So we had like two pictures, or four pictures actually, we always had, and which one is equal and then they'd have to point to it so they didn't have to say it. Again, our vocabulary group did better, but what was really fun was this manipulative group in the middle. What we did there is we just gave them a pile of stuff and said, make it equal, make, or make two piles, make them equal. equal. And we'd, if they didn't know two yet, we'd give them two things to, and then we'd look to see whether it was equal. And we did that with a number of, we couldn't do it with all the words because it's not always easy to find something to manipulate with all the words. But that's really actually what, for me, when I was watching that and watching the kids do that, because I was doing fidelity checks, I was like, wow, these kids not only can say it, they get it better. They conceptually get it. So that was exciting. So we took that back to Reading Corps and said, hey, maybe we should talk, read, and write more about math. 
We should treat math as a language. Put it in our repeated read aloud. Put it in throughout the day. Let's just, let's embed those math terms. And then we also did do some activity kind of like things that, um, that would supplement, that would directly more explicitly teach some of the concepts. Now I did not do all of this work, but, but was a part of this team that was working on it. Currently I'm doing um, some work with in more intentional use of play in kindergarten. Actually my first goal is to get more play back in kindergarten and then to intentionally use it so that kids can learn both academic and social emotional skills. Um, not just play for, and play for play's sake is great, but there is a lot of pressure and we need to have it a really enriched environment. So it's okay to do these kind of things in kindergarten that we were doing in pre-K. Um, we're also working on just looking at measuring vocabulary growth for some of our vocabulary interventions. And my scholars apprentices are here. They have been typing madly in all of the things that all the kids said in kindergarten on this measure where we give them a word and then we ask them <laughs> what they think it means. And sometimes it's really funny. So, so uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite. The word was mistake. And the kid, I'm not kidding, said, well, North Dakota is a mistake. <laughs> That's so classic. And I, he might have thought the word was state, but he said mistake, right? Right? Okay. This is another one. They're just very, I don't know. Drink. Drink is like eating something, except you don't have to chew. Now that's the thinking of a kid, right? Yeah. Okay, so what I've learned, it's okay to have fun. It's okay to have fun with your college students, with your graduate students, um, that fun and relationships are part of it all. Uh, I've already talked about a lot of this, but in my classes, you know, I try and give students the chance to talk, um, to talk to each other, to write things down. Uh, I do a lot of worksheets, probably more during COVID than I used to because I don't want to make everything super where they have to get up and move around too much. Um, that blend of explicit, implicit, um, I've, I've talked about that stuff. My lessons for relationships, sometimes you have to slow down take a deep breath and just really have a conversation, right? And that's hard. We d often don't have time, but it's really important because relationships are where we really learn about each other and it's where we can address equity issues, I'm convinced. And it's also where we can build our language skills and the language of our profession even. Um, we wanna teach the whole kid and have shared positives. That's another seeds term where, where when, you're, when you're teaching and learning, it feels good, right? And then the power, our words are powerful. I think we know a lot, we've talked a lot about language in the last few years, especially around some of the equity work. But in school psych, <laughs> you know, correct me if I'm wrong, probably within the first couple of weeks, we talk about high inference words. Kids aren't naughty or lazy. They're not even smart because that's a within child. There's nothing we can do about that, really. But we can talk about a kid who's running around the room during the time when we would like them to be doing something else, right? He's really active. I mean, at least that gives you somewhere to start instead of saying he's naughty or she's naughty, right? The other thing that some words can include or exclude, this is a really silly example. Don't take away from this that I think that people shouldn't have done this, but it, it was a recent example that made me just feel a little bit like, oh, I don't know how that feels, right? Um, if anybody's been on Facebook, there's been this like post a picture of your firstborn, right? Has anybody seen that? Um, maybe it's because of who I'm Facebook friends with. Anyway, so I've seen it, and they're like posting, and so everybody's posting pictures of their kids. Well, I have, my oldest two kids are my stepkids, and I have an adopted daughter, and then I have a biological son. Which of those is my firstborn? It made me feel a little like, hmm. Now I would assume they meant our, your oldest child, so it's not a big deal. Like it, I, I'm not like mad at them, but it made me think about, gosh, I, feel, I don't know how to react to that, right? And I think a lot of our words have that power. Um, language sets a tone. I was recently at a training with an administrator and he said, you know what, we don't talk about our substitute teachers. They are our guest teachers. And we talk to our kids about how do you treat a guest? And I'm like, whoa, that's cool, right? And especially because it wasn't just a change in language, but a conversation that went around that. I thought that was pretty cool. You are never too old for a read aloud. So if you, have, if you have not read out loud with a group of people or even to yourself or read a poem out loud 
there is something about the power of, of oral language that's really, really uh, amazing. This is actually a picture from a Boundary Waters trip I took with a group of women last summer. Um, Connie Peterson was there, she's in the back, and we were reading Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime, out in the wilderness, and it was cool. It was fun. So, um, I think if you haven't been convinced by now that language is important, that language and literacy are linked, and that uh, we all have a role to play in our homes, in our schools, uh, I haven't done my job, so I hope that you feel that way and that you go home and either write something or read something or talk about this talk to somebody. Um, uh, what questions are there? Oh, and yes, when you work in preschool, you get to have funny, you get to enjoy uh, the humor of COVID. Good night, Zoom, and brown roots, brown woods. what do you see? <laughs> so what questions are there? Go ahead, Jeremy. they're coming from before I can get to them learning about yeah well I think relationship and there's a lot of, of research on relationship and teaching but I also would argue that a teacher who really is in tune and can have a kid be successful that it's not it's not always relationship first and then learning it's like learning in relationship you know it, there's a slight difference because you can spend all day getting to know your students and really feel like you know them, but not teach them much. Um, and so I think it's, there's, there's a mix of that that needs to happen. But yes, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of need for really acknowledging the power of that connection. Um, that doesn't mean the evidence-based practice, you just do whatever you want then, because uh, there are better or worse things to do once you've made that, re that, that, um, that leap. Um, but I do think that relationship is key. And our four-year-olds, you can see it in their behavior <laughs> and how they act whether or not they feel like they're seen, heard, acknowledged, and whether that's a good way to be acknowledged, they, that they're wanted in that setting. Other questions? Go ahead, Robert. I'm a first grader teaching literacy. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how does a school psychologist, because we didn't have one in our school when mm -hmm. I taught, um, partner with classroom teachers and support the work of the classroom as a school psychologist? Well, Amy, do you want to take that one? She's a psychologist. No. <laughs> well, and I think part of it is knowing, knowing that there are those resources available. Um, and oftentimes, people don't know they have a school psychologist. We we're, we're sometimes joke that we're stealth psychologists. Nobody knows that we exist. Because we often do work with the most at-risk students and not always with the general classroom teacher. Um, but we can, and we know a lot about learning and instruction. And um, so a lot of times it's our job to get to make sure that that's known. And we establish a relationship with the teacher. We're on some of those teams or meetings, and we speak up, but in a respectful way, because you know a lot about your kids and early literacy. But if you want support, I'm here for you, and these are the things that I can do. So it's that building that communication about what's available and being in, being in the same room you know, just being able to know what resources are there. I think, how do I do? And problem identification. And problem identification. So no, uh, you, we often are, are use data, that database decision making, to say, okay, like you're worried about this kid because they're low on this skill, but when we look at your classroom norms, you actually have six other kids that look an awful lot like that kid. Like maybe we should do this more as a small group or would there be something that we could do with all the kids that would raise the tide for all the kids? Anything else? I don't have a watch, sorry. I'm really bad at time management. I will. <laughs> and I think I might put it in the president's room in McLean. because. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for your time and attention today. There are goodies over there. 
I really do hope that you, um, that you use this as an opportunity to reflect on your own um, language experiences and those around you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That was very exciting and engaging. A couple of things you did say. First, you said, feel it. Can you feel it? Did you feel it? Yes? No? Yes? Did you feel it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then the other thing she said to me, I thought she said, we teach the whole person. And um, here, that's what we do with MSUM. And that's why we love our faculty. That's why we take the time to do what we can to encourage them, develop them, provide them the resources to be able to generate that student success that um, we generate here at MSUM. And so again, I'd like to have one more round of applause for Lisa. And as promised, we are going to give you a thought. 